Hi, and welcome back to Ask Dr. Amy. First, I hope you and your family have been as safe and well as possible during this difficult time. This pandemic really has touched everybody. And as a pediatrician, I wanted to come back today and update you on some things specifically related to kids. You might have heard this in the news already. It's been called the Kawasaki-like disease or pediatric multi-system inflammatory syndrome or PMIS. I know the coverage can sometimes be a little confusing or it's not clear how does this apply to us. So I wanted to just share what we know so far, what we can do about this, and hopefully we can achieve that fine balance between not panicking, um, but still being vigilant and giving our kids the best possible chance. I feel like everything this pandemic needs to be dated because everything happens so fast. So today is May 19th and um, we'll talk about what we know as of today. So the true number of this syndrome is not clear, but in New York, uh, we've identified 147 cases. That is a lot of kids who are ill, but if we think about the global scale of how many people have been exposed, I would say this is still a relatively very rare condition that happens. We'll talk about the exact numbers a little bit later, but I think it's important to note that this is unlikely to happen statistically given any kid who's had COVID. Now, secondly, I want to make the point that this is actually not Kawasaki, but I can understand why it's been called that or uh, compared to Kawasaki because they share some very similar symptoms. For example, fever, rash, pink eye, heart problems, which we'll talk about. It's a little bit different, but functionally affecting the heart. And of course, kids can get very sick from either syndrome. But I think it's also important to note that it is a different entity, a different syndrome than Kawasaki because the diagnosis is quite different given what we know so far. Um, the treatment, if any, are also different. So I think distinguishing that can hopefully help us catch all the cases that we need to detect and also not give the wrong treatment at home. So first, what is Kawasaki anyway? That is actually also a full body inflammatory syndrome. So in that way, it is similar. But Kawasaki is thought to be related to specifically arteries. It's an inflammation of the arteries in the body. And the heart-related problem that it causes is the coronary arteries, which supply blood to the heart muscles, can be affected and then therefore decreasing the heart function overall. We don't know exactly what causes Kawasaki. One of the popular theories is that kids, as they're exposed to normal viruses throughout their childhood, they can mount an immune response to fight off the virus which can then, when they have a genetic disposition, can then turn into this full body inflammation called Kawasaki. So and again, that way, it's a little bit similar to what we think is causing PMIS, which we'll go into a little bit more in just a second. But about Kawasaki, the diagnosis actually requires five straight days of fever before we actually consider it on the algorithm. And it's important to note that for PMIS, it's not necessarily, you don't need five full days of fever. Um, just after one day or 24 hours of true fever, we should start to think about it. So I don't want us to miss cases because we're thinking Kawasaki, it should be a long fever course. And secondly, because of the coronary artery changes, uh, one of the mainstays for treatment for Kawasaki is high dose aspirin. And this is about the only case in which we give children aspirin at the age of 12, because the side effect of giving aspirin to kids can be very toxic for the liver. So I wanna again distinguish that this is not Kawasaki disease, meaning our concern for this shouldn't lead us to immediately take aspirin at home. And now even though they're different, again, they can share some very similar symptoms. So for PMIS, you know, fever, which is 100.4 degrees or 38 Celsius um, for at least 24 hours, and then some pretty unspecific rashes. I, I'm not gonna describe the exact rash because it can look very different from child to child. Severe abdominal pain, there can be some swelling of hands and feet, pink eye, and in some kids it can affect the blood pressure, dropping the blood pressure, which can cause you know, listlessness or fatigue, or just in some way behaving not quite like themselves. I'm leaving this broad and vague because it, again, the symptoms we've seen are pretty unspecific. So I want you to be vigilant of a wide variety of symptoms, especially if they happen at the same time. And over a short course of time, it's something we should be thinking in the back of our mind. So is this COVID related? In the beginning, most of the kids who were tested did test positive for COVID, either in the virus or in the antibody, meaning they've been exposed at some point. But some kids were also not positive for either one. But as of this week, the CDC now officially thinks there's a direct link between COVID and PMIS. And the thought is that like any virus, COVID causes an immune response in us and a severe immune response can then remain in the body and cause inflammation, which can then show up with the symptoms of PMIS. And the kids who so far have tested negative, but with the syndrome, 
um, my thought is that there's a window between when you no longer have the virus, but your body hasn't made enough antibodies to be detectable. So there can be a negative window where if we test them later on, um, they're more likely to test positive for antibodies. So given what we know about this so far, does this mean that COVID is actually specifically bad for kids? Do we need to be more scared of kids having a bad outcome? I think the answer is yes and no. The PMIS so far we tend to have only seen in children. And the thought is because their immune response, which is very good at protecting them from COVID related bad outcomes, might be responsible for this new set of symptoms. But again, it's actually exceedingly rare given what we know so far and looking at parts of the world where the virus rolled through the communities a lot earlier than ours, for example, in Europe and Asia. Now, given the millions of cases around the world, as well as the many more millions of exposure cases that we might not know about because we didn't test for them, it is actually a very, very small number for kids who do get very sick from this and then end up in the hospital. And of the kids who've gotten sick, it looks like three children in New York have died from this. And I don't know if there are underlying medical conditions, if they have, for example, heart problems or anything that makes them not deal with this systemic assault as well, um, that can be part of a bad outcome. But again, we don't know. It's always a tragedy, especially when a child dies from something like this. But I want us to not panic about this in the sense that the numbers don't show most of them do go on to recover and then very few kids get this to begin with, even after they've had COVID. Now the treatments have been largely supportive, meaning we make sure they can breathe okay, we make sure that we can support their blood pressure with medicines if they fall, and then try to help the heart function as well. The other mainstay of treatment is something called IVIG, which is in a crude way described as kind of washing out the really active antibodies from the body and as well as steroids, which temper the immune response. And the fact that those two things have shown pretty good results in PMIS further leads us to think it's an immune response related phenomenon. I think this definitely adds another layer of how scary COVID is to a population, especially previously thought to be largely spared. But again, this is actually not specific to COVID at all, but actually the flu as well as um, more famously, the Coxsackie virus, which is a common childhood virus, can attack the muscles of the heart, much like PMIS does. And this inflammation of the muscles of the heart can then decrease the heart function and lead to all the systemic problems. The outcome is that most of these kids have recovered. After a time, the immune response slows down. And we also, you know, with IVIG, try to help bring down the reaction a little bit. And with support for them throughout this time, for their vital organs to function, then eventually they recover. So I know me saying statistically that most kids do well with this doesn't actually make a parent feel better because you're worried about your child, he or she is not a statistic. So I think it's important for us and for the parent to be just vigilant, anything out of the pattern of ordinary that might suggest something like this. So again, looking out for fever, rash, severe abdominal pain, and the rapid onset of these symptoms, as well as a deterioration always, I think the most important thing is to make sure you have access to your pediatrician so you can call and it's not your job to diagnose this at home. And the earlier we catch this, the more of a chance we have to support them as early as possible to get the best possible outcome. And lastly, because we don't know exactly who's been exposed or not to COVID and even people who've had a negative test can then be exposed or the result can show up later, I would say we should always assume we could have been exposed as well as everyone we come into contact with. So I would monitor for these symptoms in every child while knowing that, again, statistically, it is very rare and unlikely for this to happen at this point. So what we are now is that the pediatric community is actively reporting every case and being vigilant and coming up with our own diagnosis algorithms as we learn about this syndrome through each new case that happens. And just like the post-flu, post coxsackie post and even Kawasaki has seasonal patterns, they tend to follow as a virus rolls through the community. We also expect this to be temporally related to COVID in the sense that as we decrease COVID in our community and the exposure, or as we start to all have herd immunity, the new incidence of these syndromes should go down if they follow the pattern of the other post-viral processes. I think it remains encouraging, according to the new um, articles published in JAMA Pediatric this week, that children from the COVID side still continue to do well, and especially healthy kids without prior conditions. What we said before about them being protected is still true. Now for the small, small subpopulation that are dealing with this, the best thing we can do is watch out for the symptoms, call the doctor early and try to get support as early as possible if it's necessary.
So on behalf of everyone at Kinder, I wish you and your family continued wellness and safety through this time.